Good morning, Valley Church. My name is Garrett. And my name is Monica. And I want to just say a special congratulations again to the graduates. I hope you had a great time. And I want to say thank you to everyone who came out to the drive through yesterday. I hope you guys had a great time. All the graduates had a great time. And thank you for helping out. And a special welcome to those who are new or have only been coming around recently. We have a digital connection card in the chat if you feel like you want to get reached out to by one of the staff members. Mm -hmm. So for today, we're going to start off with a couple of songs and then hear a sermon from David Lawson and a communion from Dustin Washington. So right now, I'd love us to focus on why we give. Here at the Valley Church, we believe godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practicing generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. There's information on the screen if you feel compelled to give. We also have a special announcement. Next Sunday, we'll be celebrating Father's Day at our indoor in-person service. To all the fathers, we'll be handing out breakfast burritos before service, so please come early if you would like one. We also have more information on indoor service in general in the following video. Good morning, Valley Church. Jennifer and I are here today to share with you some very exciting news. Over a year ago, on March 15th, the Valley Church, like every other church in California, was required to shut their doors because of the impending pandemic. The past year and three months has been full of many challenges. Some of these challenges were personal and others were ones that we faced as a society. And while all these were difficult, they were made harder by the fact that we could not meet together as a church family. This is why we are excited to announce that on Sunday, Father's Day, June 20th at 10 a.m., we will be having our first indoor service since the beginning of the pandemic. We can't wait to welcome you back to worshiping God with us inside our church building. But as you can imagine, some things have changed since last year. So we want to give you an idea of what you can expect to see when you arrive. The first thing that you will need to do to join us for our indoor worship is to register online at Eventbrite by 6 p.m. on Saturday before the service. Seating indoors will be limited to 150 people, so we will need to know who is coming so that we can prepare the seating accordingly. You will have overflow seating outside in the courtyard if you would still like to worship in person. And of course, you can still watch the service online at thevalleychurch.com. So when you arrive at church and park your car in the parking lot, you want to make sure you see a member of the hospitality team to check in. Upon checking in, we will screen you for your temperature and sign you in. While we would love to have you with us, if you are feeling sick a little bit, we encourage you kindly to just stay home and worship with us online. Once you've checked in, if you wish, you will be given a yellow wristband if you are a bit cautious and wish to avoid physical contact. After you have been checked in and have received your wristband, you will find a basket with disposable communion emblems. Please make sure to grab one as you make your way to your seats. At this time, we will be having family-style worship service, so that means no child care at this time. Families will be sitting together for our one-hour service. When you enter into the auditorium, you will notice that the chairs have been set up in groups of twos and fours. We ask the members of the same household to sit together. If your group is larger than four people, you can feel free to move some of the chairs to accommodate your group size. Since we are talking about the chairs and the auditorium, we want you to know that we are having the auditorium and chairs clean to the current CDC guidelines weekly before our service so you can worship comfortably and safely together. Yeah. Well, we understand that the state of California is moving guidelines around wearing masks in June 15. We are asking everyone who is attending to services to please continue to wear a mask as we navigate our return mission. Understanding that everyone is at a different level of comfortability around this topic, let us listen to the words of the Apostle Paul when he says, let us therefore make every effort to what leads to peace and to mutual edification. So that's right, baby. Our return 
to worship is a celebration of all that God has given us. And we want to thank you for your patience during this time. And while we understand that everyone has a different viewpoint on this topic based on a number of factors, this is not the time or place for such discussion. We are here to worship God and love our brothers and sisters and welcome everyone. So church, once again, we are excited to share this news with you and to be able to worship together in person with all of you. We know it has been a challenging year, but we believe that the Spirit of God is preparing for us in this time that the Valley Church is heading to a whole new era of experiencing God's love and participating in God's mission here in the San Fernando Valley and beyond. We love you and can't wait to see you June 20th. Thank you, Caesar and Jennifer. Now let's go to God in prayer before we continue on with our service. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to connect in this social medium. Um, I pray that we can really praise you and glorify you, learning more about your spirit and being uh, impacted by the words of David um, and Dustin as they do our sermon and communion, God. I pray that we can really listen and hear with our ears and our hearts um, and that we can be moved in our souls, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you guys at home uh, for joining us today. Please sing along as we do one more great song.
Amen. Let's keep singing, everyone.
faith walks above the storms, oh, even when the world caves, even when the fight calls, even when the wars raise, don't take heart, I know you are greater, forever you're my savior, I will sing your praise, with all that I have, with all that I Singing the night, my hope's alive in you. I'll walk through the fire and not be burned. Pray in the fight and watch it turn. Jesus, tonight I'll give it all to you. I won't let the storm weather my heart. Won't let the darkness beat me down. Singing the night, my hope's alive in you. I'll walk through the fire and not be burned. Pray in the fire and watch it turn. Jesus, tonight I give it all to you. Even when the world caves, even when the fight calls, even when the wars waves, I'll take heart. I know you are greater. Forever you're my Savior. I will sing your praise with all that I have, with all that I am, Lord. With all that I have, with all that I am, Lord. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh. storm weather my heart won't let the darkness beat me down sing in the night my hopes alive in you oh i'll walk through the fire and not be burned pray in the fight and watch it turn jesus tonight i give it all to you i won't let the storm weather my heart won't let the darkness beat me down Sing in the night, my hope's alive in you. I'll walk through the fire and not be burned. Pray in the fight and watch it turn. Jesus, tonight I give it all to you. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you made Every burning star, a signal fire of grace If creation sings your praises, so will I promise you don't speak in vain no syllable empty or void I 
For once you have spoken All nature and science follow the sound of your voice And as you speak A hundred billion creatures catch your breath Evolving in pursuit of what you said If it all reveals your nature so alive I can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky and canvas of your She still obeys you so alive So Stars were made to worship, so will I If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I If the oceans roll your greatness, so will I For if everything exists to live to high, so will I if the wind goes where well, you said it, it's so alive If the rocks cry out in silence, so alive If the sun will fall, our praise is still for Then we'll sing again a hundred billion God of salvation, you chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created, the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Where you lost your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've done Every part the sad in a work of art If you gladly chose to surrender, so will I I can see your heart a billion different ways Be precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind
morning, Valley Church, and welcome to our service today. You know, today is actually a very significant day. Um, this is actually going to be our last pre-recorded service, at least for now. Who knows what the future holds for us, but uh, this will be our last pre-recorded service before we start doing indoor, in-person service next week for Father's Day. Uh, and so we'll still have an online service for you to be a part of. That's actually going to be a, a, a part of our church going forward forever. Uh, but what we will be doing is instead of pre-recording like I'm doing right now in, in a studio here with Monica and Garrett and a camera in front of me, uh, we'll be in person in the auditorium and, and you will be seeing the same service that the people who are here in person are seeing. And so uh, if you're ready to come back, we of course want to see you here at the building. Uh, you do need to register for the indoor service, but we will have outdoor service as well. Uh, but if you're not ready to come back yet, that's okay. We will still have an online experience for you. We'll have an online experience for you when you're traveling, when you're sick, for your friends who maybe aren't quite sure about coming to church yet. We really want to continue to build upon this space because we believe that God is going to perform miracles through it. We have seen people who have, who have studied the Bible and have gotten baptized this year and have never been to our church. The only experience they have is through Zoom or through you know, a, a FaceTime call. And so we believe that God absolutely wants to continue to do great works through this online space. But this is our last pre-recorded service. And before uh, I started preaching today, I actually said a little prayer and I got emotional about it. You know, we thought this was going to be a, a six-week period when this all started. We thought, oh, six weeks, we'll be back, no big deal. Well, here we are now, a year and four months later. And, you know, we're, we're just engaging back into indoor, in-person service. And so, uh, what a year it's been. Uh, the lessons that we've learned, the suffering that we've endured... Uh, the, the challenges that we've all faced personally and collectively. Uh, but we have made it through this time because our God is faithful and because he's provided a way out for us. And so we're looking forward to seeing you in person if you're ready for that. But if not, we are continuing to, to worship with you online and, and we love our online family. So we're going to continue our series that we started a couple weeks ago on the Shema. The Shema comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and it says this, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. This is an ancient Jewish prayer that has been said uh, from this time till now, uh, every day, twice a day, in the morning and at night by the Jews, uh, and by many Christians as well. And it's a reminder of who our God is and, and what our relationship to him should be like. And so we're going to look at the word today, love, that shows up here. And that word in Hebrew is ahava. And it speaks to a, a, a relational love that we have with our God. But the challenge we face in our world now is that word love has become so diluted. You know, I can say that I love pizza or I love my wife. I can say I love the eagles or I can say I love my son. Right? We all know that these are not the same things. You know, we, we throw around the word love so casually. You know, we, we can say we love that new show Loki on Disney+. Plus, But we don't really love it, right? We're just very excited about it. We're, we're looking forward to the next episode and, and decoding the mysteries that are there by Marvel. Right? But it's not love. Right? We use love to describe food or a relationship to a pet, to our family, to, to the weather outside today. Right? But all of these things are not the same. Right? The love that we have for, for each one is different. And so love can be a... a sometimes an inadequate word to use. And so what I want to look at today is an example from the life of Jesus where we actually get to see love played out because in this prayer, the Shema, that word love implies action, right? It's not just a feeling, but it's a, re it's a response to that feeling. Very much like the, the first word we looked at, the Shema, right? Listen. It, it, it involves listening, but it also involves a doing, right? An obeying of the commands. And so what we're going to look at today is a story that you might be familiar with, right? It's a story of the Samaritan at the well, right? Jesus shows us how to love. And in fact, we learn to love through his example because he loved us first. And so we're going to turn now to the book of John, the gospel, and we're going to be in chapter four. We're going to do an extended reading here, but I'm going to break it up into different segments. And what I want us to look at and to identify with here is this interaction that Jesus has with this woman. And how we see Jesus' love for this woman play itself out, not just in what he says, but in what he does. We're going to start now in John chapter 4 and verse 7. It says this, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. 
The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews did not associate with Samaritans. So we're going to stop right here because this is important for us to identify. Right? Jesus is at this well, and it, it's, you know, we, we didn't read this passage here, but right before it says it's noon. Right? The sun is, is at its peak in the sky. So it's a hot day. Jesus has been walking in his travels, and he's tired, and he's thirsty. He sent the disciples to get some food in the town nearby, and he has this encounter with a Samaritan woman. Now, this is important because he asked her for a cup of water, and she's, she's taken aback, right? She, she's not used to a Jew asking for something like that so directly because Jews and Samaritans didn't associate, right? And the reasons why are, are many, but it really involves the, 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 the exile of the Jews, right? When they, when they were taken out of Israel by the Assyrians, the, the king of Assyria at the time implanted his own people into the land. And so they intermingled with the people who were still there and, and created this, this, this hybrid race uh, of people who were kind of Jewish, but not really. They, they, they did some of the Jewish practices and they worshiped in some of the ways that were familiar to the Jews, but then also involved a lot of pagan uh, worship and, and concept as well. And so they weren't really Jewish. And so they were looked at as lesser than. They were looked at as enemies by the Jews. In fact, the region of Samaria actually like cut between uh, Judea and, and, and other portions of Israel. And so the Jews would go around Samaria, right, to just avoid going through this land because it was unclean, it was undesirable. They didn't want to interact with people. They didn't trust the people. They thought of them as enemies uh, and, and villains and, and people who were just out for no good. And so for Jesus to talk to this woman is a shock, right? For him to talk to a woman by himself is also a scandal, right? In this culture, at this time, a man was not to talk to a woman who wasn't his wife or, or one of his family members. It was seen as improper uh, or impure. And so it was not common for a man to just address a woman so casually, let alone a Samaritan woman. And so she's shocked. She's taken aback. She, she's asking, well, are you supposed to be asking me for this? <laughs> you know I'm a woman, right? Like you can see that clearly. But you know I'm a Samaritan too. And yet Jesus asked her this question, will you give me a drink? So we read on. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So we have this scene here now where they're, they're having a little bit of a, a verbal sparring session, right? They're kind of going back and forth and and Jesus is being very ambiguous, right? If, if you were this woman and he was talking about living water that you can't see and not hear, like that wouldn't make sense to you either, right? <laughs> You're not supposed to understand what's happening here. But, but Jesus is kind of laying the groundwork for what he's trying to, to do in this moment, right? And he talks about the, the, the gift of, of, of living water where, where you won't have thirst anymore, right? He's speaking of himself, but she doesn't quite understand that yet. She doesn't know that yet. We read on now in verse 16, and it says this. Jesus told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Now, Jesus is ready to get to the point of what he's here for. Here's this woman. She's a Samaritan. Right? She's by herself. It's noon. Right? The sun is high in the sky. It's the hottest part of the day. And if you're familiar with that culture, you would understand something that, that, that was clear to Jesus all along. Why was she there by herself in the heat of the day? It was customary for the women to go in the morning when the weather was still cool and to go together because going alone was dangerous, right? There were people who, who were trying to cause harm to others. And so to go by yourself as a woman in that time would have been very risky. And so the women usually would go together as a community, take out the jars, help each other. You know, those who are maybe a little bit older would get some help from the younger ones. 
And they would go and it'd be a time of, of, of community and fellowship where they would engage and, and talk about the, the days, you know, the events of the day and, and what happened before and who was, you know, getting ready to marry who and all the, uh, all the town gossip or whatever it might be. But here's this woman by herself, the hottest part of the day, and we got to address why. And so Jesus asked her a question and he knows what the answer is going to be. He says, bring your husband down here. But she can't. Right? Because she doesn't have a husband right now. And so she answers that. Look, I, I, I have no husband. And Jesus sees her honesty. And he's like, you've answered correctly. right? You've had five husbands, in fact. And right now you're living with someone who's not your husband. Now this scene can, can look really harsh. right? It can look like Jesus is calling this woman out on her sin. Calling her out on the fact that she's had five failed marriages. And now she's with another guy who's not even her husband living in, in, in a sinful relationship. And maybe that's what's going on here. I don't, I don't think so, though, right? Because I, I, I know our Lord well enough and, and other stories that we see here that I still think that's the character of Jesus. He's not trying to, to catch her, you know, in this moment. It's not like, aha, gotcha, you know, you're busted. I think something very different is happening here, actually. You know, I recently just started watching a series that some of you guys might be familiar with. I'm, I'm a little late to the party here. It's called The Chosen. And basically what it is, it's a story of Jesus and the people that he chooses to follow him and, and kind of their exploits. So it's taking the stories from the Gospels and, and putting it together as one story uh, and really just showing you that time period. Uh, my wife actually w was trying to get me to watch this. Uh, she really wanted to watch it. But I was like, ah, I don't know. It just doesn't really seem, you know, my thing. And, uh, you know, it, it was that or Captain America and the Winter Soldier, right? Like I was like, ah, I don't know. I think I'm going to watch that one right now because I know what Marvel produces. And so I didn't watch it. And... I got. I got to tell you guys. I absolutely love the show. I think it is so well done. Uh, it, it brings such a, a humanity to the stories that we read about in the Bible that was always there, right? It, it, it's there for us to, to imagine and visualize, but to see it out on the screen and to see it done well and treat it with respect and love and care has really brought to life some of these stories. And one of the major episodes, actually, I think it's the finale of the first season, is the story we're reading here. They take some artistic liberties, and, and they have to speculate on, on a lot of the stuff that's happening between the stories in the Bible. Uh, but they don't do anything that's out of context or character. You know, these are all things that you would believe to be happening. Well, they get to this story here, and, and, and what you see in the interaction between Jesus and the Samaritan woman is not a God who is looking to condemn. It's not someone who's trying to go, ha, I got you, you filthy Samaritan. We knew you were all like this. This is why we don't trust you guys. This is why we don't come through your land. Because you're all unclean. You're all unworthy. You've all made mistakes. The picture you get is, is of, a, of a God who sees someone who is in pain. She's had five marriages that have failed. I don't know what the story is behind that. I don't know if that was her fault or the fault of her spouses or probably more real, realistically the fault of both parties involved. We don't know if that was because of death or tragedy. We don't know if these husbands were abusive or loving. We really don't know a lot. But what I think we can assume, though, is that, that no one goes into a marriage thinking, I want to have at least five of these. Everyone who gets married and makes those vows believes that that's going to be the only time they get married. They believe that this is, this is for life, especially in that culture. Right, because everyone knew the stigma. Everyone knew what it meant to be a divorcee, right? Uh, let alone one time, but five times, and then to be living with someone who who wasn't your husband. So I, I'm pretty sure she didn't wake up and say, you know what? I'm just going to be this 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 wicked woman who's no good at marriage, who's unfaithful. I don't believe that was her heart. I don't believe that was her plan. I think Jesus sees that. He sees a woman who is hurting. She's isolated. She's alone. She's by herself. She can't engage with her community. She, she, you know, her, her, her own peers won't accept her because of the choices she's made, because of where life has brought her to. And so we have this picture here of Jesus interacting with her, and, and he's, he's revealing these things about her life, not to, to shame her or to, to make her feel guilty or to condemn her, but to show her something about him. Because what's happening here is Jesus is revealing himself to this woman. You know, when he asked for a cup of water, sure, he was thirsty. He had, he had a physical thirst that needed to be quenched. But he wants to tell her about a water that would never leave her thirsty again. 
he was ready now to embark on the mission that God had sent him here to do. And that mission was to seek and save those who have been lost. To bring healing to the sick. To bring comfort to those who, who are hurting, who are alone, who are isolated. You know, many of us in our lives have found ourselves in places that we never thought we would be in. No one wakes up and, and thinks, today is the day that I'm just going to be a terrible person. No one wakes up saying, you know, today is the day that I'm going to continue uh, just drinking until I, I black out. Or today is the day that I'm going to pick up a drug habit. Or I'm going to go ahead and get someone pregnant. No one wakes up thinking like, you know, my life is just going to be a failure one time, you know, repeating itself over and over again. Right? When we're little kids, you know, I talk to my son, and like, what do you want to be? It's always like an astronaut or a dinosaur, you know, wrangler or, you know, whatever. The dreams we have when we're kids are huge. They're limitless. But somewhere along the way, life happens. Sin enters into our lives. We allow it to come in. We make a mistake. And we find ourselves in a pattern that just continues on and on until sometimes we find ourselves just like this one, alone, isolated, and, and unable to, to, to find a way out. We're, we're gasping for air. We're, we're panting because we're thirsty. And we keep going to water. We keep going to our addictions or we keep going to our sin thinking, okay, if I just get one more, one more drink from the well, it'll, it'll fill me. It'll, it'll satisfy my thirst. And it never does. You know, when I think about my own life and I think about the, the years that I spent pursuing my lustful desires, looking at pornography and giving in to the sins of the flesh, never once did I walk away feeling like, ah, oh, I am satisfied now. I have, I have discovered everything I want. I, I no longer need this in my life. I have filled myself. No, it was always, when's the next time? When can I indulge again? When can I allow myself to do this again so that I can just get another drink from that well? knowing that it's not going to fill me, knowing that it's not going to satisfy my thirst. Right? I know that's the same for you guys as well. You know, just one more day. One more day to, to do fill in the blank. One more, one more girl to sleep with. One more guy to sleep with. One more drink from, from the bottle. You know, one more day to just give in to my own self-pity. One more day to just be lazy and, and, and to just not do anything with my life. One more day to hold on to that grudge, to not forgive the person who's hurt me or wronged me, right? I'm pretty sure you've never been satisfied by that. And yet sometimes we keep going back to that well, hoping that one more drink of that, that water will, will, will quench our thirst. Well, what Jesus is offering her here is a water that will not leave us thirsty anymore. He's offering us himself. He's offering us a way to break that cycle, to no longer be isolated and alone like this woman, to no longer be held captive by the choices that we've made or by the, the, the things that have happened in our lives that have brought us to where we are at today. You know, I don't know this woman's story. I don't know why she's had five husbands. I don't know why she's with this other guy. But Jesus doesn't come to condemn her. He comes to restore her. To, to quench her thirst, to give her hope, to give her something to, to, to believe in that's greater than, than the ancestors, that's greater than uh, a place to worship, you know, whether it be here on the hill or at the temple or whatever it might be. He's giving her living water. We read on, and verse 21 says this. It says, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. You know, she had a question for him. I, I, I didn't read that section. You can go back and read it. But, but she was saying, well, look, the, the Jews say we should worship at the temple, but our ancestors worship here in the mountain where, where Jacob built this well. And, and what's right? You know, like, we can't even go into Jerusalem. We're not welcome there. And Jesus says, look, I understand that. Right? Salvation does come from the Jews, and, and the temple is where we worship now. 
but a time is coming, and in fact, it's actually here today, where it's not going to matter where you worship. It's not going to matter if you go to the temple, you come up onto this mountain, you're by yourself, you're in community. A time is coming when you are going to worship in spirit, and you're going to worship in truth. Because that's what God desires. He's not looking for people who are worshiping in the right fashion or the right way, on, on, in the right day, in the right posture, in the right position, and location. He's looking for people who are going to worship him from their heart, from their spirit, and who are going to worship him in truth. Right? This woman has been isolated from her community. She's been isolated from the world. Right? As a Samaritan, she's been isolated from, from being able to enter the temple. And Jesus is telling her now, that's all done. The choices you've made, albeit they weren't great, but that's done. What I've come here to do now is to give you a drink of the living water. And you will never thirst again. You will never be isolated. You will never be alone again if you worship me in spirit and in truth. He's giving this woman hope. He's not just telling her that he loves her. He's showing her. By his actions because he shouldn't have been talking to her she was a Samaritan she was a woman she was a sinner there's no reason Jesus should have been interacting with this girl in fact Jewish law would have would have encouraged him to just kind of keep her at a distance to ignore her and let her go about her day or to call her out on her sin and, and condemn her for it but Jesus doesn't do any of that he reveals her sin but not to condemn her but to show her something about him so we read on the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. This moment here is, is really amazing because this is the first person that Jesus reveals that he is the Messiah to. Not the disciples, not to the religious leaders, right? There are some people who knew like his mother because of the prophecies that were given to her, but, but Jesus has never revealed himself to be a Messiah yet until this moment. And it doesn't make sense because it shouldn't have been her. It should have been the high priest or it should have been the Pharisees or it should have been Jews, right? <laughs> at, the, at the bare minimum, his disciples, the guys who left everything to follow him, he should have revealed himself to them first, right? That's, that's what... Logic tells us that's what, that's what you know, we would have done, right? That's, what, that's what, what would have been expected of Jesus. And yet he chooses in this moment to reveal to this woman, this Samaritan woman, this unclean, imperfect Samaritan woman. He chooses to reveal to her that he is the Messiah that's been promised, that the one that, that her and everyone else in the area has been waiting for has finally come. And so, yeah, I wasn't just talking about having a drink of water. I wasn't just talking to you because I was just trying to pass the time. I was showing you that the time has come now where no longer will you have to thirst, where no longer will you have to be burdened down by your sin, where you will now have hope and a chance to move on and show people who you truly are, your spirit and your truth. You no longer have to come out here by yourself in the heat of the day. You have no, no more reason to be ashamed of the choices you've made, the mistakes you've made. Because I am here to quench your thirst. I am here to show you how to worship God truly. I am here to bring you peace and hope. That's what's happening in this moment. And he chooses to tell this woman that. That blows my mind. It's unbelievable, right? And the, the scene plays out in the show, The Chosen, and I was in tears watching it. Because the woman they got to play was just so great. She, she, she was performing this, this, this character in such a way where you know, she was offended by Jesus talking to her. And, and she was very skeptical and she was critical. And, and she was someone who had been hurt in her life. And you could see it. You could feel it. You, you just felt the pain. And as Jesus begins to reveal to her the names of her five husbands, right? We, we don't get all that detail here in the scripture, but the show elaborates on it. And he, and he, he begins to name them one by one. And there's the realization that this person is not just some guy. He's not just some Jew here to, to cause me trouble. He knows me. He knows the challenges that I face. He knows the mistakes I've made. But he knows the real me underneath all that. 
the, 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 the little girl who grew up thinking one day she was going to be the perfect bride, pure and faithful and, and, and honoring her husband. And somewhere along the way, that got lost. But he knew that little girl. And so as he's revealing these names and he's, he's telling her what he knows and she's beginning to understand who he is, there's just this freedom that you see come over her face of, this is it. I don't have to live in fear anymore. I don't have to live in doubt. I don't have to live in shame or guilt or pain. Jesus didn't happen upon this well by chance. He came there for a purpose. And what we see here now is him loving this woman, this woman who, who is in desperate need of, of someone really, truly loving her. Not just saying, oh, I love you. Go home, peace, shalom. But someone who, who truly knew her, who could see inside of her and, and look at the things that weren't pretty to look at. And in spite of those things, tell her, I love you. I'm here. I want to bring you comfort. I'm going to give you water that will, that will never leave you thirsty again. That's the amazing miracle that's happening here. And so he chooses to reveal himself to this woman. And we're not going to read it now, but the next chapter, she goes back to the town and she begins to just share with everyone what she's experienced. She tells everyone, there's, there's this guy who, who has told me my whole life. He knew it all. He is the Christ. He has come. And what happens over the, the course of the next couple of days is the entire town uh, of Sakaar comes to Jesus and they begin to, to listen to his teachings, to be healed by him, to, to be ministered to by him. Almost everyone in the town gets to hear the gospel before anyone else. And it's all because this woman was vulnerable and she was willing to engage with Jesus in this way. And so she shows her love for Christ. She shows her love for God in her action. She could have just kept it to herself. Said, Man, this, what a great day. I'm going to go and see you guys. I'm on my own now. I don't have to worry about this anymore. But she goes back to her home and she tells everybody because everyone she knows has some kind of pain has some kind of hurt has some kind of sin that, that they've been holding on to or they continue to go back to all of us today have something that we're holding on to that we just don't want to let go of that we're that we're afraid if, if someone knew this about me they wouldn't love me they wouldn't they would judge me they would they would they would ridicule me they would cast aspersions on me but she didn't care about any of that she had just met the Christ, the Messiah that had been promised to them for generations. And she wasn't going to let a day go by where she didn't tell someone about that. And so she tells everyone that she sees in her city. And the whole town comes to see Jesus, to know Jesus, to be ministered to by the Messiah. You know, for us who are in this church, who, who call ourselves disciples, who call ourselves Christians, we've had a moment like this already, where Jesus came to us at the well and he said everything in our lives that we had done. He knew everything. He knew the mistakes we made. He knew the hurt that we'd caused, that had been caused on us. He knew the little boys and girls that we were and the dreams that we had. He knew that none of us wanted to be the people that we were. But somewhere along the way, we made mistakes. And we found ourselves going back to that well, just constantly thirsty, looking for another drink. You know, growing up the way I did, I never knew if my father loved me. He never said it outright. He wasn't there. He, he, he abandoned my family. He was abusive to my mother, to myself, to my brother. And so I always grew up wondering, does my father even love me? Does he even care? Sure, he bought me gifts, but, but I never had a relationship with him. But when I look at my son, every single day I tell him I love him. I can't, I can't tell him enough. I can't stop telling him that I love him. Everything that I do, and, and I'm not perfect, but I, I think about how can I spend time with him? How can I be a better father for him? How can I provide him the opportunities I never had? And so, yeah, maybe I'm broken and I have hurt in my life, but, but one thing I know is that my son will never grow up wondering whether his father loved him. Right? And that's because of what Jesus did in my life, of the water that he gave me. That's, that, that's the only reason I'm able to do that today. Otherwise, I'd probably be doomed to repeat the same cycle my father did. And so for me, and for us who, who call ourselves disciples, we need to imitate this woman. And we need to tell everyone that we have met the Messiah. We know who he is. In fact, he is here today. The, the kingdom is now, right? We are living in the time that was promised, where we would no longer have to fear, no longer have to be, be hold 
um, be beholden to our shame, to our guilt, where we could live in peace and have forgiveness for the mistakes that we made, and where we could be loved by the Father in such a powerful way. And so we should, be, we should be exactly like this one, telling everyone we know, our families, our communities, our, our, our classmates, our co-workers, people on the street, strangers that we've never met before, because of what Christ has done in our lives. You know, if you're visiting with us and you're here for the first time, you know, I want you to understand that, that he has brought you here to this moment because he wants you to have a, a similar interaction with him. He wants you to, to sit there with him and, and understand that he knows the hurt that you're carrying. He knows the mistakes that you've made. He knows the decisions that have brought you to this point. But he's not here to cast judgment or to make you feel guilty or shame. He's here to bring you water that will never give you thirst again. He's here to give you hope in something bigger than yourself. He's here to show you what love truly is. Now all you need to do is believe that he's the Messiah, to give your life over to him. And he will give you that water, that living water, and you will be able to worship in truth and in spirit, no matter where you're at, no matter who you are, just like this woman did after this encounter with him. Church, I love you guys. I, I, I am, like I said, it, it, it's weird because this is the last time I'm going to be pre-recording a sermon. I can't do any more edits, at least not, you know, you know, in, in the cutting room, <laughs> you know, you, you guys are going to see all the bloopers from here on out uh, in real time. But I can't wait to be back together again as a church family next week. Uh, if you haven't registered already, please go ahead and register. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're still going to be here online. It'll just be different, uh, but it'll be the same time, 10 a.m. Uh, but we can't wait to worship with you uh, in truth and in spirit uh, because we serve a God who has loved us first and has shown us how to love. So that's why when we, when we hear the Shema, and it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, the Lord is God. Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. This is what he's talking about. It's loving in this way. It's a love that isn't just a feeling, but it's an action as well. Thank you, church, for letting me share. Love you guys, and we'll see you soon. Good morning, church. My name is Dustin Washington, and I'm a part of the awesome Marriage Ministry here at the Valley Church. And I'm going to be leading hearts for communion. In doing so, I'd like to share, uh, you know, a topic that means a lot to me. And uh, that's going to be the topic of love. You know, in the past year or two, I've, I've become a new husband, um, you know, but also a new father. And for me, you know, that comes naturally with so much love. You know, I've, I've experienced some measurable amounts of love with Malachi and Davian. And, you know... Every day, it's like, you know, something new that I, you know, I fall in love with them. I get to share, you know, a new experience with them. And it's amazing. You know, there's no other feeling like it. But at the same time, you know, there's those parts of love that take hard work and determination. There's times where, you know, coming home, you know, I'm tired or they're having a bad day. And, and it really takes a lot of perseverance um, to show them that same love, to give them all, you know, all that I can and to be, you know, the best version of myself for them. It, it, it takes, you know, the hard work that I have to put in there for them. But at the end of the day, it's always worth it. It's always worth seeing a smile on their face and, you know, them giving me the, the most joy, again, that I could feel. And that reminds me a lot of the cross. It reminds me a lot of, you know, what being a disciple is like. It, it's sometimes to give the love you know, it could be exhausting. It could be, you know, draining to, to give love. And sometimes we don't always receive love, even from, you know, family, friends that we may expect it. Um, we don't always get that same, you know, thing back. So sometimes it's difficult when reading the scriptures, like, man, how can we give all this love? And sometimes I don't, I don't feel the same way to return. But, you know, Jesus really, you know, you know, hits it right on the head with the nail when he says, you know, love is the most important thing above all. At the end of the day, you know, that's, that's what really binds us together and really unites us as a church and as a family. You know, we see many examples of Jesus in the Bible where he's gone through adversity. He shows unconditional love. He really has to persevere through his challenges in all aspects. And that's really the greatest example that we can have 
on how to show love and how at the end of the day, no matter, you know, what we go through, you know, in our days, no matter how our work might be, how our, our classes on, on campus might have been, that, you know, we still have that love, we still have that family, we have that bond and unity that'll get us through our day and that'll get us to our end goal, which is making it to heaven together. <laughs> so as, as we prepare for communion, I just really pray that, you know, I would like to lead us into prayer and just really remind us that love is what is what keeps us together, that if we continue to love each other, we can get to that end goal. And no matter how hard it is, no matter what hurdles we have to go over, you know, we're going to do it together you know, as a church, yeah, as a family. So if you guys could bow your heads with me, I'd like to lead us in a prayer and get us, um, you know, lead us to communion. Father God, thank you so much for everything you've done um, for all of us, God. We really love the way that you love us, God. I pray that I can love just a portion of the way that Christ loved us, God, that I can show that unconditional love to all, you know, family and friends, and that we can really just be that example to others of what love should look like as well, God. We appreciate everything you do for us. We pray that in our, in our hard days, we can still give, you know, the love that we can and that we can, you know, receive that feeling of love in times of need as well, God. I thank you for all you do for me and my family here, and I pray that, you know, we can all be together very soon and, and you know, be, you know, hug and be in, in arms together, God, and just really also feel that other, you know, version of love that we, you know, we miss as well, God. But until that time comes around the corner, God, we just pray that we do our best to love each other and to really appreciate, you know, every moment we have, God, and be that same version of you that you love us to be, God. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
To the end 